Welcome Earth and Space Science students to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. Uh, we wish we could be here in person, but uh, we know you can't right now, so we're going to make you uh, do our best to make you feel like you're here um, during this virtual field trip this afternoon. If you are watching this and have not registered for this field trip yet, you can still do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register. Once you get there, you can get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. We just use that information for our attendance purposes. And today's field trip is going to be about plate tectonics. So during this virtual field trip, students will discover that plate tectonics is the global mechanism for major geological processes. So we're gonna start off today by discussing seafloor spreading, ocean ridges, rift valleys, and subduction zones with Mrs. Fuller. Then we're going to discuss earthquakes, volcanoes, and mountain ranges with, with Ms. Ramirez. Then we're going to calculate the motion history of plate tectonics um, with me. And last uh, but not least, we are going to discuss convergent, divergent, and transform plate boundaries with Ms. Nash. While we're doing all of that, you can ask us questions, um, but since this is a virtual field trip, the way you ask questions is by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. And once you get there, you're gonna fill out a very short form to submit any questions you have related to plate tectonics for us. We will do our best to answer all of your questions for you in the time that we have with you today. Uh, so please do ask questions. And without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and turn it over to Mrs. Fuller who will get us started with plate tectonics. Good morning, good afternoon. We're gonna be talking about plate tectonics, which is how the continents uh, move, how the plates move around the, the planet. I'm sure you've noticed, let me show you a picture. It's actually a 3D model. And I'm sure you've noticed that when you look at the globe, it looks like South America could tuck right in here in the side of Africa. Well, there was a real famous man by the name of Alfred Wegener, and Wegener saw that and he thought, hmm, I bet you at one time there was just one, uh, one big continent. He called it Pangaea, and uh, he came up with the idea that, well, there are some things around the world that are the same, like fossils and things like that. And he came up with this idea of continental drift that the, the, the big uh, continent, Pangaea, broke apart and everything drifted apart. Well, he was born in uh, 1880 and uh, all the scientists then made fun of him. They mocked him, he, uh, he had a bad day. And uh, unfortunately, he, uh, even though his idea was correct, he didn't li live to see uh, that validated. And he froze to death on a field trip in uh, Greenland in uh, 1930. Well, uh, time rocks on. Oh, and there was another guy, I'll talk to you about him in a minute from Croatia who has some interesting things about the layers of the earth also. So um, in the 1950s, um, they, they came up with the idea of sonar and they started mapping the ocean floor. Uh, and there was a, a wonderful woman scientist, her name was Marie Tharp, and Marie Tharp wanted to go on this big ocean adventure with all these other scientists so that she could also help uh, work with the sonar and help map uh, the ocean floor, and they wouldn't let her go. They said, women can't go on a ship, it's bad luck. Uh, you know, well, there you go. So anyway, uh, this is a wonderful book about her. Um, Ocean Speaks, and I recommend it highly. It's a picture book, but it gives you some really good ideas about what happened to her. Well, what she did was they would send the data back to her and she was a cartographer and she would she made a map of the floor of the ocean using the data that these guys gathered. Well, guess what? She said that the sea floor was spreading and that the, uh, there were great mountain ranges taller than anything on land and they made fun of her and made her redo the maps and when she redid the maps it came out the same. 
And there was a scientist who believed in her. Everybody else made fun of her, just like they did Alfred Wegener. And this guy's name was Jacques Cousteau. And Jacques Cousteau said, I'm going to send a submersible down and check this out for you. And what do you know? Her maps were correct. And Marie Tharp uh, really wasn't given credit for what she did. But she did this work in 1957, but it wasn't until the 1960s that these ideas were embraced, that the sea floor is broken in, in the oceans and it's starting to spread. Magma's coming out and forming more land and pushing them apart and forming these big mountain ranges. So uh, that's sea floor spreading. And uh, well, what's, what's driving this? Well, what's driving this is, if you look at our little map here of the layers of the earth, underneath the crust, the lithosphere is the mantle. The mantle is very, very hot and the heat circulates. It cir circulates in convection currents, just like the ones you see in a lava lamp. It always goes in a circle with the convection currents in the mantle are the same way. And it pushes these plates around. And uh, so what happens when one plate pushes into another? Well, let's see if I've got, I've got a picture of that. Here's a picture of something called a subduction zone. This is oceanic crust, which is denser than a continental crust. So when the, the two meet, the denser crust goes underneath, but it pushes on the continental crust. So two things happen. When it goes down like that, that's called subduction. But if that pushing part causes mountains to form. This is how the Himalayan mountains were formed in India and Nepal. It was by the subduction of the, the, the oceanic plate that pushed on the crustal, on the continental plate and formed these big mountains. That's called orogeny. So subduction causes orogeny. Okay, now the next one um, we're gonna look at is going to be uh, Great Rift Valley. Here's the Great Rift Valley in uh, Africa, it's very famous and it's actually three rift valleys together. And what happened was the big continental plates that formed Africa are now starting to separate. And they're separating right along this line right here, causing this huge rift valley and guess what's underneath it, pushing it, magma. And the magma comes up and forms volcanoes and it puts a lot of methane in the, the lakes there. And if there's ever a big earthquake, it might let a lot of poisonous gases loose. So rift valleys are very interesting, but this is a, an old plate that's now breaking apart, very similar to what we see in C4 spreading. Okay, now we're gonna talk about something called hot spots. Hot spots are big plumes of magma in the, in the, the mantle that are real close to the top of the lithosphere. And these are huge uh, um, pieces of, of magma and periodically they erupt and the magma comes out and forms lava and it'll form, uh, it'll form an island. So some oceanic hotspots are an example would be Japan or the Hawaiian Islands because as the plates move, and the hot spot uh, releases the magma, an island is formed and then it moves some more and guess what, another one happens. So that's why on the Hawaiian Islands on, their, on that little arc right there, you can see that same arc shape here in the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska. Um, Yellowstone is a hot spot. Yellowstone is actually considered a super volcano and the hot spot underneath uh, Yellowstone is enormous and if it blows it's going to affect the entire United States, not just Wyoming. And the last one we're going to talk about are hydro, uh, hydrothermal vents and these are deep in the ocean, it's very dark down there and these are in trenches and seawater gets in and gets superheated by the magma that's real close 
to the surface and it spews out and it's and it comes out at 700 degrees but it's not boiling and the reason why it's not boiling is because the pressure is so intense because it's so deep in the ocean that there are organisms there that get their nutrients and their energy from it. And it's called chemosynthesis. You know, the plants we know here uh, where we are, they, they make sugar with light, photosynthesis. Well, these guys are like worms and they get their, their source of energy from the chemicals that come from this superheated water. It's very interesting. The last thing I'm gonna tell you about real quick is our Croatian scientists. His last name is Mo, um, Moho Rovišić, and this was a big deal in the 1960s. Um, he he uh, came up with an idea of a divergent zone uh, uh, in between the, the, the lithosphere and the mantle. It's called a discontinuity. So it's at the very bottom of the lithosphere, and it's right between the lithosphere and the, the mantle. And it's called the Moho Ravishik discontinuity. And there was a time in the 1960s where scientists thought that they could drill down to it and find out what was in it. And it was a real big deal. It was all in the news. Everybody was excited. But after about four years, there was mismanagement of the project and a lot of politics and they abandoned it. But the project was called Mo whole, H-O-L-E, but it was named after Mr. Moho Rovišić. So that, those are just a few high points of um, plate tectonics, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Broughton if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. The question that came in was, uh, how do scientists know um, where hot spots are and where magma is is coming up through the earth and and what is inside the mantle, um, and mostly um, scientists use uh, seismographs to look what to look at what happens when earthquakes um, occur. Now earthquakes are are um, happening all over the planet, um, where the especially where the edges of these plates are, and uh, every time there's an earthquake. It sends out seismic waves and then scientists observe those waves to see where they are bent, uh, reflected, sped up or delayed by various layers um, inside the earth because uh, like Mrs. Fuller mentioned, we cannot drill down to take samples or, or directly observe things. We have to use um, tools like seismographs to see those waves. All right, now we're going to explore uh, earthquakes, volcanoes and mountain ranges with Mr. Ramirez. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, uh, we're going to be focusing on how does plate tectonics account for geological processes and features uh, specifically pertaining to earthquakes, volcanoes, and mountains. Uh, so to do that, we're going to look at a little uh, slide of some pictures and some videos um, as we explore some of those features and processes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys, and then we will start the presentation. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about really quickly is just a quick review. Uh, Mrs. Fuller already talked a little bit about it, and that's just plate tectonics. Um, so as she men mentioned, um, a tectonic plate is just a large piece of the Earth's lith lithosphere. Um, and it's important to note that it is not static. So they are constantly moving. Um, each plate will move and interact with the other plates. And specifically in this segment, we're going to be talking about the formation of mountains, volcanoes, and earthquakes as a result of that tectonic plate. And so just a couple of cool things that I learned as I was doing research for this segment um, was that there are actually extinct volcanoes here in Texas, and one of them is Pilot Knob, um, and that is the largest extinct volcano in central Texas, and it's it's been inactive for millions of years. Um, but if you go visit there, you can actually still see the remains of its lava flows um, still evident within some of, some of its rock and soil structure. And then over here, we have Davis Mountains, which I have been to. And Davis Mountains um, was actually formed from volcanic activity about 25 to 30 million years ago. And that, um, if you've never been, I highly recommend it. It is very beautiful out there. Um, and so the next thing we're going to take a look at um, are plate tectonics and their role in mountain formations. Uh, so generally mountains will form from the convergence of two plates. 
So convergence just means that these two plates are colliding um, into one another. Uh, so for example, uh, if we take a look at the Himalayas, uh, the Himalayas were uh, created when the Indian plate collided with the Eurasian plate. And again, this took place a long time ago. Um, and that is what produced the Himalayans. So I'm going to show you guys a cool little fly through tour of the Himalayan mountains from Google Earth. Uh, so it's on my bucket list to go see, uh, visit Nepal in that area one day. So here's the little video. Hopefully it plays. And as you guys are watching this flyby of the Himalayans, just a couple of quick things. Um, this region is still experiencing uplift even today. Um, so scientists think um, that it's probably experiencing about a one centimeter a year uplift. And in about five to 10 million years, India itself, that land will be uh, moved about 100 and, 180 kilometers inland. I'm going to go ahead and stop that there. Uh, but if you're interested in seeing more of it, you can always just Google uh, Google Earth Himalayan Mountains. And then the next thing we're going to take oops, the next thing we're going to take a look at, if it will let me progress my slide, there we go, um, are some other different mountain types. Uh, so really quickly, I just want to see if you uh, observe and look at these four different pictures, see if you can match the picture with the mountain type. Uh, so there are four main mountain types. Um, and we there are volcanic mountains, dome mountains, folded mountains, and fault block mountains. Uh, so really quickly, just see if you can match the picture uh, with its mountain type, and then we'll go over uh, some of those answers. So some of them look pretty obvious. Uh, so the first one we're going to take a look at is number one. Uh, so number one is a dome mountain. Um, and obviously it looks very round looking. Um, and it's formed when magma is forced up between the crust and mantle, but it doesn't ever flow out. Uh, so that magma is making the, the land bubble sort of like a balloon. And then if we take a look at number two, that one is a folded mountain. And you can actually clearly see those folds. An example of a folded mountain would be things like the Himalayans, uh, the Andes, and the Alps. And if you take a look at image number two, you can see uh, the folds. Now observe what direction are those folds going. Um, and the, him, uh, the folded mountains are created when there's a collision and it's compressing the boundary. So the rocks are warped and folded. Um, and I think Ms. Ms. Uh, Mrs. Fuller went over some of these words already with you guys. Uh, but really quick, if the folded mountain is kind of, if the curve is more like an in, so it's a downward curve, we call it an anticline and it has the oldest rocks in the center. And then if the curves, or if the folds are kind of like a U, it's called a syncline, and the youngest rocks will be in the center. So if you take a look at picture number two, uh, and you look at those folds, what direction is it uh, moving? So do you think number two would be an anticline or a syncline uh, for its folds? And then look at picture number three. So picture number three is a fault block mountain. And an example of that would be the Sierra Nevada mountains. And you can see those massive uh, sheer rock faces in number three. And they form when enormous underground pressure forces a whole rock mass to break away. And then of course, number four, hopefully y'all got that one right. Number four are the volcanic mountains. And a volcano is just a type of mountain um, that connects with reservoirs of molten rock below the surface of Earth. Uh, so those are just a couple of types of different mountains. And then uh, for plate tectonics, the next few topics, we're going to be talking about earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, so if you take a look at this image of some plate tectonics uh, of the pl different plates, be thinking about where do you think you will find the most earthquakes and volcanoes? So go ahead and make your uh, prediction, where do you think most earthquakes and volcanoes will occur? And then I'm going to show you guys a quick little simulation. Let's see if it will pull it up. And let me pull up this one. Uh, so take a quick look at this simulation. Uh, notice our key over here. Uh, the earthquakes, when I play the simulation, the earthquakes will be uh, in the round circles. And the bigger the circle, the higher the magnitude of the earthquake. 
And then the circles will also be different colors. So if you look on the key, uh, if it, it's a red circle, its depth is not that great. But if it's a blue circle, then it's occurring at a greater depth. Um, and then you'll also notice the colors for the boundaries. So a yellow line indicates a convergent boundary. A pink line represents a transform boundary. And that kind of teal color represents a divergent boundary. And then you'll also see uh, triangles. Those triangles will represent volcanoes in the time since their last eruption. So I'm going to go ahead and play the simulation and then make some observations about what do you see or notice um, about the locations, um, the depth, or the uh, volcanoes as you watch this. And this is just a little simulation from seismicexplore.concord. So hopefully, guys, we're able to notice that most of our earthquakes and volcanic activity occur along or near those plate boundaries. Uh, so we're going to go back to our presentation, and then we'll continue on. Uh, so th those presentation, that little simulation was for uh, earthquakes and volcanoes. So now we're going to talk about those volcanoes. Uh, volcanoes are usually located along divergent boundaries, but can also be formed along convergent boundaries when there is subduction occurring. And you'll learn more about the, the different types of boundaries later on um, in the segment. So here's a little quick uh, video to explain uh, the process of volcanoes forming. Again, our internet's been slow. <laughs> It happens because hot rock rises, heated by the Earth's core. Near the surface, the rock spreads in two directions and goes sideways. It begins to lose heat. Eventually, the much cooler rock sinks back down. Through this spreading process, the Earth's crust is very slowly dragged apart. And it's this that ultimately causes the continents to move. Where the plates collide, the rock on the seafloor containing carbon from the dead plankton is carried deep into the earth. So that would be As it descends, this layer of rock is heated, so the rock melts, releasing carbon dioxide. And gas is returned back into the atmosphere during an eruption. The remarkable cycle is complete. So that was just a little interesting video uh, to for volcanoes. Oops, let me go forward. Um, the next thing we're going to look at are plate tectonics and their role in earthquakes. So earthquakes can occur along all plate boundary types, uh, but especially along transform plates. And transform plate boundaries are just when uh, two tectonic plates are sliding horizontally past each other. Um, so if we take a look here at this uh, graph, uh, see if you can interpret and analyze the graph. So what does the data indicate and what might be the cause? So hopefully you guys were able to notice that starting from around 2010, we are seeing a huge increase in the number of earthquakes in central US. Uh, so why do you think that might be? And then uh, just to tie this in more locally to you guys, since we're in Texas, um, back in the end of 2014, 2015, there were a whole bunch of small minor earthquakes that were reported in the Irving area. Um, so you can see from this data chart uh, that most of the earthquakes were rather small. So they were um, around two and a half or less uh, for their magnitude. So they were very small earthquakes, but that led scientists to wonder why is this happening? Uh, so uh, SMU, the city of Dallas and the city of Irving actually installed 22 seismographs as a result of those 2014, 2015 tremors. Um, they haven't quite yet determined an exact cause, um, but what do you think might be the cause of the increase of, of these earthquakes? And then here's an image of Texas. And on the left, you're seeing a diagram of Texas and some of the earthquakes that are natural. 
some of them that the red dots are the earthquakes that are occurring near oil fields or wells. And then the yellow dots are spurious, meaning they don't have an exact cause that we haven't yet quite determined. And then on the right, you're seeing a picture of Texas and then some of the fault lines within Texas as well. Uh, so think about how does fracking and or oil drilling and its waste injections affect faults and the Earth's lithosphere? Um, so I will tell you that according to the uh, US Geological Society, um, fracking itself does not directly cause the quakes, but what they end up doing is the disposal of waste products from that fracking. So they're injecting that waste into the ground, thousands of uh, miles into the ground. And that is what they think might be causing uh, these changes or these small minor quakes. So that's something for you guys to research and look into um, is the process of fracking and their waste disposal methods. And then uh, before we go, just a quick little reflection question. Um, think about what are the risks and benefits humans endure as a result of plate tectonics? Uh, so we know of a lot of the, the risk of the plate tectonics and some of the negative effects of the movement of plates, but can you think of any positive effects uh, because of plate tectonics? And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing our screen and then we're gonna give it back to Mr. Broughton and he's gonna answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Um, the question that came in is how many plates are there? And I am not exactly sure how many uh, plates there are all together on Earth's surface because there are um, some really big plates and then some smaller ones. But I do know that there are uh, seven major plates, the African, Antarctic, Eurasian, Indo-Australian, North American, Pacific, and South American plates are the seven major ones. But then there are smaller ones too. And we're actually going to look at a some plates again here. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, click present there. There we go. So you can see another picture of tectonic plates. And you can see that some are very big, like this is the North American plate. Some are kind of medium size. This is the uh, Nazca plate. And then some are smaller. This is the Cocos plate. Uh, so there's lots of plates if you add up even the little ones like here's like you know one little one there and, and there I don't know the name of those this one is a smaller one that's called the Juan de Fuca plate um, but uh, I'm not exactly sure the, the total when you, if you count the small ones too but plates do move and scientists use uh, formulas to calculate how fast they are moving so one way scientists do that is um, using a hot spot that created the Hawaiian Islands. And this arrow right here is showing what direction those plates move. Uh, they uh, divide the distance from the island to the hot spot because the hot spot does not move. The plate moves over the hot spot and then calculate the, um, the uh, age of the rocks to see how far those um, islands or how, how much that plate is moving each year. And so you can see like this island right here is moving at about 11.7 centimeters a year. Um, this island is 9.1 centimeters a year. This one is 8.9 centimeters per year. Just using a simple formula, rate of plate movement, um, or like the, how fast the plate is moving, equals distance divided by time. They can do that uh, over a hot spot like where Hawaii is. And uh, I mean, if you're watching this on demand, you know, click pause and you can go to this website to, um, to check that out. There's lots of different websites that um, use the Hawaiian Islands and the hot spot as an example of um, calculating the motion history of plate tectonics. But that is not the only way scientists calculate um, the motion of plate tectonics. So another way that they do that is uh, a little more complicated than, than how Hawaii um, works. So the motion of a point of one tectonic plate relative to another plate can be described by the relative velocity vector V. The velocity V has a magnitude and direction and is given by the product of the angular velocity vector W and the plane rotation vector R. So the equation looks like this, V equals W times R. 
although it is it is not speed equals distance divided by time or or something as simple as that it's a little more complicated and the reason for that is is because we are describing motion on the surface of a sphere as opposed to a flat plane that's linear uh, remember the earth is a is a ball it's a sphere so you can't just use um, distance divided by time uh, for different things so here here's the website um, where you can find more about this uh, and here's one example of how that works. So if we want to know the relative velocity vector of the North American plate relative to the, to the Pacific plate, you can use the angular velocity vector of 0 0.00000078 degrees a year times pi divided by 180. And then the plane rotation vector is found using a point in the North American plate located a at a rotation pole called the Euler Pole in Quebec, Canada at 48.7 degrees north, 78.2 degrees west, and another point on the Pacific Plate near Parkfield, California at 35.9 degrees north, 102 or 120.5 degrees west. So you plug those numbers into that formula, and again that formula is just V equals W times R, or the, the relative velocity vector equals the angular velocity vector times the plane rotation vector. So uh, V would equal 0 0.00000078 degrees a year times pi divided by 180. That's that this part here is the W and then times 6,371 kilometers times uh, sine of 33.28 um, I think degrees, and I of course use the calculator to figure all to to um, figure out these answers. We break it down. So, pi divided by 180 is 0 0.0174, and then uh, the sine of 33.28 is 0 0.54873. So then you when you multiply this times this, you get this, and this times this is this. So when you multiply those together you get 0 0.0000476 kilometers a year, which is the same as uh, 0 0.0476 meters a year, which is the same as 4.76 centimeters a year or 47.6 millimeters a year. So you can say the North American plate is moving at 4.76 centimeters a year compared to that uh, Pacific plate that's right next to it. So that's a little bit more complicated than than just three plugging three numbers in. There's there's more to it than that. But how that works is uh, the Euler pole is right here in Quebec, Canada, and the North American plate is rotating around that pole. So that's not the North Pole. That's the Euler pole, and and that plate is going that way. Parkfield, California, is right here on the. Um, San Andreas Fault, and this is going uh, north. So while most of North America is moving kind of a southeasterly direction, this plate is moving uh, northwest. So they're they're moving opposite each other. Now here's a kind of a zoomed in um, uh, picture of that. That's California, and um, there is Parkfield, California. So the point that they were looking at is actually on this side of that San Andreas Fault. It's going this way, whereas um, the North American plate is going this way. And a kind of a challenge question that uh, we're going to do together is um, how long would it take the location near Parkfield to reach the pleasant location of San Francisco? So San Francisco is way up here. And of course, there's earthquakes happening all along this uh, San Andreas Fault, but this uh, this point eventually, over some period of time, is going to make its way all the way up to where San Francisco is now, and then San Francisco will be farther up or who knows where by that many years. But how you figure that out is uh, we got we have to know how far it is from Parkfield to San Francisco, and it is about 200 miles. We need to know that relative velocity vector, and I'm going to use the kilometers per year 
um, distance. So 0 0.0000476 kilometers a year is how um, fast the North American plate is moving relative to the Pacific plate. And we also have to know since um, if we're gonna do this in miles, but this is kilometers, we're gonna have to change kilometers to miles or miles to kilometers. So the, the uh, conversion is one mile equals 1 1.6 kilometers. So 200 miles is equal to 320 kilometers. And then that distance divided by the kilometers per year velocity vector would give us 6,722,689 years. So it'll take 6,722,689 years for um, Parkfield to reach San Francisco. So it's, it's gonna take a long time, but it is happening. And scientists could figure that out using that formula um, the, the relative velocity vector equals the angular velocity vector times the plane rotation vector. All right, let's take a look at an interactive map here of what the Earth looked like millions of years ago, because now that the, you know those calculations, scientists can use those to see what the Earth looked like, like about 100 million years ago. So. Now, let me see if I can make that a little bigger too. There we go. So you can see Texas was mostly underwater about 100 million years ago. And that's why right here in Dallas and around the Dallas area, we can find fossils of aquatic organisms and that they used to live here about 100 million years ago. If we go back even farther, like 240 million years ago, now we're getting closer to how Pangaea looked. You can see it's one all connected landmass. And there's Texas right there in that, according to this uh, simulation. So Texas wasn't underwater, then it was, now it's not, and who knows how it's going to be uh, millions of years from now. Uh, you can see there, there's most of South America and most of Africa, that, um, and they kind of fit together like that puzzle piece. So we can, um, using these calculations, uh, um, estimate how the earth looked millions of years ago. They also use fossil records um, and other other ways um, besides just the calculations. And um, if I stop this and go back to my presentation, here is a picture of how earth might look 250 million years into the future. So you can see that uh, South America and our and our Antarctica are going to kind of come together and Nairobi is in Africa right now so Africa's kind of up in there there's North America Europe Asia Australia we'll have a another Pangaea again now this is National Geographic's um, hypothesis but let's look at one more uh, video here of how the earth might look in 250 million years So I guess I got to click play. So there's 50 million years, We've got 200 million more years to go. There's Australia joining in with uh, Asia. Africa's becoming more part of Europe and, and uh, Asia. North America breaks away from, from Asia. And there's Antarctica sliding up towards um, the rest of um, the continents there. And you can see North America and South America drifting towards uh, Europe and Africa. Um, I guess mostly Europe and Africa.
So now just 50 million more years to go, but the Pacific Ocean is getting huge. And there, South America finally bumps into uh, Africa and then North America does as well. And so the Atlantic Ocean almost completely disappears. Uh, I think in that National Geographic, they called it the Atlantic Sea. And you can see even with this one, which is from Tech Insider, the Atlantic Ocean is about all that's left of it right there. So kind of an interesting interpretation of how things might look. But again, um, they're using um, equations that relate uh, time and distance to predict future motions, locations, and resulting geologic features of the plates even 250 million years ago are, are into the future. So it's um, not guaranteed to be that way. We'll, we won't be around to know for sure if that's correct, but using these um, equations, that's what scientists predict uh, today. So that's my part for you. Um, let me see if there's any questions here. And uh, the one question is, how do scientists know that that's going to happen? And they don't know for sure, but they do use um, some pretty complicated equations. I think that that um, equation that I used that, that was the more complicated one with the North American and um, Pacific plate is uh, trigonometry, but it's spherical trigonometry. So it's, it's uh, the best um, math they can use um, give it with the information we have right now. And um, again, a, a human being can only live for a hundred years. So we won't, we won't be around to see what it'll be like 250 million years from now. All right, now we're going to look at, uh, looking at um, convergent, divergent and transform boundaries with uh, Ms. Nash. We might have lost Miss Nash, I guess. Uh, but if we did, um, convergent boundaries are the ones where they are coming together. Uh, divergent. I'm back. I'm oh, sorry. I don't know what happened. Somehow you lost them. <laughs> your fault somehow. Well, I used to have a bumper sticker on my car that said, reunite Pangea. And it's going to happen. But I won't be around to see it. So here's Pangea, okay, the one big continent. And as we said, it broke apart, and we have what we have today. And we have three classes of plates. We said this is what we're talking about. Uh, um, convection, and here's my lava lamp to show how convection is working under the under the interior of the earth. So when tectonic plates meet, we get those exciting things. The earthquakes, volcanoes, drifts, and mountains. Okay. And we have three kinds, convergent. They're converging, they're coming together. And if one plate is lighter in the ocean, in particular, ocean plates are lighter, so they are called subduction. It means that one goes under the other. If this happens in the ocean, you get oceanic trenches, lava, magma can come up and create the ridges or volcanoes. When we have an oceanic plate meeting a continental plate, the oceanic plate will go under and the continental plate will go up. And that's what happens when we have like the Andes Mountains, that's what's happening along the edge of South America. When we have two continental plates colliding, it's what we have with, with India colliding with the Asian plate, then we have the giant mountain ranges of the Himalayas that this, this um, Ramin is searching. We also have our divergent boundaries and they're being pulled apart. And on land, we get the rifts in the, under the ocean, we get magma coming up and forming the ridges, like Mrs. Fuller mentioned. And we have the transform boundaries, so they're sliding across each other. 
and we get the earthquake like like Mr. Um, Rotten was showing you. So we're gonna quickly, quickly see if we can do this and um, share some, just a few pictures of uh, these things happening in real life. Okay, really quickly. There we go. Okay. So again, we have our plate. And one kind of cool one to look at is Iceland. See one's going right through. That's a divergent plate going right through Iceland. I have these gigantic rifts happening. Okay. And you can see all around, this is the ring of fire, the Pacific ring of fire, where we have all kinds of earthquakes. Like, um, are you seeing here's the Himalayas being pushed up, convergent boundaries, continent to continent where the ocean goes under the continental um, plate crust, we have, again, more kinds of mountains. Divergent boundaries on land, we get these rift valleys forming. They can fill with water sometimes. And here's a really amazing one in Iceland, just being pulled apart right down in the center. Transformed boundaries, they're rubbing against each other in friction. They, they can't, they finally build up to, the point where they have an earthquake as they're sliding. Here's another great picture. I think Ms. Remy has already showed you that one. So our time is up. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask Mr. Broughton. Thank you, Ms. Nash. I'm going to uh, do a quick recap of what we did today. So again, with this field trip was all about plate tectonics. And during this virtual field trip, students discovered that plate tectonics is the global mechanism for major geological processes. So we uh, looked at seafloor floor spreading, ocean ridges, rift valleys, and subduction zones with Mrs. Fuller, earthquakes, volcanoes, and mountain ranges with Mr. Ramirez. Um, I showed you how to, a couple ways to calculate the motion history of plate tectonics. And we just saw um, examples of convergent, divergent, and transformed plate boundaries with, with, with Ms. Nash. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate you taking the time to learn about uh, plate tectonics with us. We'd like to know what you think about this afternoon's field trip, and you can let us know by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback and filling out a short feedback form for us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you during our next field trip for Earth and Space Science students. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.